So now we, I'd like to call upon uh, the global CEO, another star in the Indian philanthropic ecosystem, global CEO of Give. Many of you already, probably all of you already know him, our partner organization. Uh, he in turn will be having a fireside conversation with another star, but I won't steal the thunder. So I'd like to invite on the stage Atul Satija. Uh, thanks, uh, Sanjeev. Uh, it's my honor to actually welcome on stage a person who needs no introduction anywhere in the world, uh, uh, and most of all, this campus uh, where he graduated many, 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 many years ago. Uh, the person we're going to get a chance to spend some time with is none other than Mr. Vinod Khosla. Uh, all of us know him as a technologist, as an entrepreneur, as an investor who takes uh, improbable bets on bold entrepreneurs, amazing uh, improbable ideas, and uh, latest, greatest, uncertain experimental technologies. Uh, I can spend a long time introducing him, but uh, that will take away from the time we have with him. So with, let's uh, quickly welcome uh, Mr. Vinod Khosla on stage. Vinod, thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, so Vinod, uh, I, I remember our, uh, uh, our first chat when COVID hit, and you sent a tweet out. Vinod sent a tweet during COVID saying, a lot of people in India are struggling for oxygen. I'm happy to send plain loads of oxygen and any supply India needs uh, uh, if somebody can help make it happen. And I remember sending him a ping quickly after. I sent you a ping, if you remember, saying, uh, you know, we are doing this work on the ground. How can, I, how can I pick your help? I think during that time, I saw how much you not just opened the purse strings uh, with no cap. Uh, you said uh, uh, any amount of money you need, please consider it given. But more than that, how fast can you deploy to save as many people as we can in this window. That, my, that was my first brush with uh, very, very high level of trusted giving without even uh, you know, asking any question downstream based on uh, uh, the work that was needed we on do, the ground. I, I did check your reputation with the Gates Foundation. <laughs> <laughs> OK, the fact that I got the money means he didn't hear anything very bad. But thank you so much for the trust. And it is not just me. I saw the same work you did with us. You worked with the Srikant Nadumani of uh, Aadhaar work uh, in hospitals across the country. What is your philosophy of giving, and how do you think about philanthropy generally for yourself? I think that's a good question to start. You know, so there's a lot of criteria. One is additionality. Is it something others can't do? In the crisis of COVID, it was very hard for organizations or governments to respond. Uh, I remember the chief minister of uh, Delhi called me and he said, look, we need help because people are dying on the street for lack of oxygen. Uh, I have the money, but I can't even issue a tender in three weeks, let alone auth authorized to spend money as per our protocol. So I need something on the, by the weekend. And so that's when, and I talked to a couple of people, and frankly, the big idea, the plane loads idea originally came from Mark Benioff. I remember talking to him and said, let's put plane loads of supplies there um, and get this immediately to people, and only individuals can personally make these decisions rapidly, I think um, we may have talked on Thursday or Friday, and we wanted to get a decision done by Saturday. Like it was hours, not days or months of, uh, for a process to happen. And I think that's where individuals can make one class of large difference. And in that category, whether it's a fire in Hawaii or 
COVID in India, additionality matters. Uh, you know, no individual philanthropist can give at the level of governments and institutions and foundations, but they can't give rapidly. And so as a person, I think of what can I do that's additional that others can't do? Uh, and there's a lot of great foundations in this country, especially, uh, more so than in India or Europe or other places that do a really good job of systematic study and systematic grants, and at larger scales than individuals do, with the exception of the Gates Foundation. Um, so it's very important that individuals do what's additional. That's one big thing. Individuals do what can be catalytic to larger giving, and we can talk about that. I think uh, we've worked together on a couple of projects where it wasn't the initial grant, but a grant started the process of very large giving by others as a role model. And so your role as a role model is much larger than your role as a philanthropist or giving something. That's, I would say, number two. Um, I've also talked about the idea of individual giving, especially willing to take risks that a foundation can. Um, so my daughter worked on a prep program. Prep is AIDS therapy in South Africa. And the idea behind supporting such a program was the government could deploy lots of money on AIDS but not on an approach that was not proven. And there were particular aspects of prep therapy that was very, very important to prove. And so if you're doing, taking venture risks or venture-like risks in proving a therapy approach works, a strategy works, then other people can come in and say, there's clinical proof for prep therapy in this particular use case. And then they can scale. So venture roles are very important because they're huge multipliers. The last thing I would say to you is just the idea of technology-based multiplication, especially to people in the valley, is really, really important. So my wife's working on a nonprofit, ck12.org. And there the goal is we are building an AI tutor so every kid can have a personal tutor. Now, lots of people working on education, but I think they're mostly non-scalable. That means if you're trying to get teachers in front of every kid, it's just a, such a large amount of money, even governments can't afford it. But an AI tutor, personal tutor for every kid, that's not hard to do. And if you develop the technology and prove it out, then hopefully others will scale it. So venture true technology development to make something scalable is very, very valuable. And uh, um, sorry for talking so much. My son's building on AI primary care doctor. And the fact is, for a dollar a month anywhere on the planet, you should be able to provide all 7 billion people on the planet with primary care 24-7 and a much higher quality than you could with human physicians. And human physicians aren't scalable. We can't say the world will create 10 million primary care physicians for the planet overnight or even in the next 30 years. You can't do that, but 10 million AI doctors, very easy to do. Sorry for the long answer. No, no, but I have to share a story with, with the crowd here. This was uh, way back in 2016. I first met Vinod. Uh, uh, I hope you remember. Uh, and I said, uh, we are skilling underprivileged youth in a classroom with English and life skills to get them into entry-level service sector jobs. And Vinod said, uh, sorry, Atul, I'm not interested. In today's day and age, why do you need human beings to teach English? I can talk to my Google uh, uh, device or Alexa or whatever. Just improve that to a point where you can actually use this and multiply. Uh, we are six years, uh, 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 seven years into it. And today we use AI in breakout rooms to actually record what people are talking and give that feedback through the tool. So what you said seven years back 
happened not because of our work, but because of your investments in OpenAI yeah. and others. And look, it was 2012, I wrote two blogs, uh, and it's a funny story behind them, but I won't take the time to go into that. One was called, it was January of 2012, I wrote a blog called, Do We Need Teachers? And I wrote a blog saying, do we need doctors? They were much un misunderstood because of the title, and I wanted the title to be controversial. But the idea was very simple, to scale personal education so the poorest kids can have that education, only AI can, is a scalable problem. I had many debates with Bill Gates who said we have to have smaller classrooms. I said that's not affordable in most parts of the world. It's not even affordable in the US. So what you need is class of one uh, by an AI tutor, and that was 2012 I wrote this piece, and it's on the web, I think it was in TechCrunch when it was still a relevant publication. Same thing with primary care. Uh, I hope there's nobody from TechCrunch here. Uh, it's still a good publication. Um, but the idea that everybody, you know, and, and I wrote a paper in 2014 or so, and I said, it's very, very likely in 25 years, I will get better cardiac care. And this is in this paper from, from probably 10 years ago, more than 10 years ago. Uh, I will get better cardiac care at a village in India than at Stanford. I live 10 minutes from campus, so I will have the same cardiologists, real experts providing care in 25 years uninformed by AI, while in a village my only option will be AI-based cardiac care. And why I will get better care in that village than I will at Stanford? because human experts can't keep up. There's no human cardiologist at Stanford that's read the five or 10 or 50,000 most recent publications in cardiology and kept it top of mind. My AI doctor keeps it top of mind, and there's a role for the humans in that. And that part got lost in my controversial title. They do the human element of care. And I had the same conversation today with the head of the American Medical Association. Just today, he came to our office, and I said, this is the model. The physicians, the human physicians do the human element of care, and the AI does, you don't want a um, computer to tell you you're dying in 20, 20 days because you have this invasive cancer. Uh, but there is a role for technology that's disproportionate and a huge opportunity whether it's in uh, agriculture, whether it's in education, whether it's in uh, um, uh, healthcare. Those are the primary basic needs of humanity and it can be hugely served and philanthropic efforts will help a lot. So Vinod, you have been making uh, uh, investments in technologies way ahead of most people do. You have taken bigger risks. Uh, uh, you famously say that you're not afraid of failure and that's your sort of uh, biggest success uh, weapon as well. Uh, In fact, let me interrupt you. Uh, there's a Harvard, Harvard Business School case where the first line of the case is a quote from me. It's not like I'm not afraid of failure. It's a much more proactive statement. The first line of this case says, my willingness to fail gives me the ability to succeed. So unless you're willing to fail, which means unless you're willing to take large risks, whether it's in philanthropy or in business, you're not going to make a large difference. Yeah, and that's such an inspiring one because this whole ecosystem of venture philanthropy, unlike the venture investments, is a very, uh, a very raw ecosystem still. There's a venture philanthropy, uh, uh, Big Bang Network, that's there in US, but there is no Big Bang equivalent in India. Uh, what do you see is the role of venture philanthropy to try out ideas that have not been tried uh, uh, in the, call it the venture investment space for the communities that otherwise may not get the uh, access to technologies, access to solutions Look, otherwise? I'm one of those biased people living in Silicon Valley and living in the venture ecosystem. I believe risk-taking, and hence the willingness to fail, but risk-taking is the key to large progress. 
Unless you take large risks, you don't come up with new things. Old things have mostly been tried, and it's also true in philanthropy. So my first exposure to this was in the 1980s. How many people know an education uh, outfit in the US called Donors Choose? Quite a few hands, that's great. In, I met the founder in 1980-something, I forget when. Um, and I think it was then, in the 80s, sometime. Uh, and he, maybe it was the 90s, anyway, doesn't matter. He said to me, uh, you know, we have to prove our model. He was operating in a new, small New York area. Uh, I said, try it outside to see if it really scales. And it took, in those days, probably a $400,000 investment for him to enter California. It was an experiment, no proof it would work at the state scale. We, we helped him with that. And since then, he's raised millions and millions of dollars scaling this idea of donors choose. Um, and so venture philanthropy was critical to proving out something that others could get behind. It's very hard for a foundation to do something, an established foundation to take those risks. So individual philanthropists should be taking lots and lots of venture risk. And I would argue that's the principal thing they should be doing. You know, you feel good about bringing computers to a village or something, but that's not scalable. Prove something new that is highly multiplicative of what you give. I think that's the role of venture philanthropy. That's awesome to hear, Vinod. You know, the, in your decades of investments in technology, you've taken uh, amazing bets. What have been sort of some examples that come to your mind that have had the most impact on society coming from the commercial, uh, the world of venture investing? Impact in... In, in society in general for the communities well, that are otherwise so, so underserved? No question, Sun started the idea of distributed computing. It did not exist. In 1996, we bet on the internet when every major telecommunication, zero exceptions, told me they would never use TCP IP for those people who are technical uh, for public internet. Never. In fact, Cisco told me they would never do products for that market either. Uh, these are very, very large impacts because you took a risk. It was very much a field of dreams. Build it and they will come. And we built it in a company called Juniper. And they, everybody came. And there was no other company because nobody, everybody was listening to their customers, which was the major telcos. By the way, uh, that was one of the largest venture returns ever in history, a $3 million investment in the 1990s, netted us seven billion in profit, 2,500 times our money. Because we took a risk, nobody else would. I think uh, OpenAI is the same kind of bet. We bet on it in 2018. So that was long before it was fashionable or even most people knew what AI was. So you have to take early risk. I think it's going to be more transformative of, of society uh, than almost any other risk we've seen. But um, you know, your next talk, I think, is on sustainability. When I bet in 2018, both on OpenAI and on a company called Commonwealth Fusion, a fusion, Everybody thought it was crazy. Most people told me, not in the next 50 years, why are you investing? But we helped start that company. We were the first investors in OpenAI because I believed the impact it would have in the world in terms of uh, you know, providing doctors for the whole planet, providing education for the whole planet, um, and all kinds of services that only the rich could afford. Fusion's the same way. If we have limitless energy, lots of problems, including water, as another major problem gets solved. And so we bet on both those in 2018. 
I recently bet on one of my most interesting projects in public transit. People say, venture capitalists don't do public transit. I am now convinced in 25 years, we'll be sitting here. I hope to be working in 25. I'm only 68. Um, that we will replace most cars in most cities. And nobody believes me today. But these are huge impact things. And whether you do them for philanthropy or do them for profit, it's the same thing. If you can have a large impact on society, it's worth doing. So you know, the, uh, you wrote a paper on uh, reinventing societal platforms through technology. And you talked about the key enablers in food, in energy, in water, healthcare, education, et cetera. You talked about some of the bets you made five years back, and you talked about transportation just now. Like, What would be the other top uh, uh, technologies that you would bet on today, or you are looking for to bet on in the next few years that you think would make technology uh, or help uh, technology that will make solutions accessible to people yeah. at the grassroots? So uh, I'll tell you a little bit of history of the paper you mentioned. It was after I turned 60, almost everybody I knew was thinking about retiring, and they were like, you know, golf, sailing, <laughs> retirement communities. And I said, what do I want to work on um, for the next 25 years? And I thought about where I could make a difference. And what I was surprised, and this is good news for those of you who are technologists, I took a month off to just study, think, and write. And I wrote a 50-page blog. Now, nobody writes 50-page blogs, but I do. And I s realized that I could reinvent almost all parts of global GDP, all parts of global GDP, not with 10 or 20% improvements, but a 1,000% improvement. And that paper, I, I posed to it myself a challenge. 700 million people on the planet have a rich lifestyle, rich in housing, rich in transportation, cars, rich in electricity or air conditioning, rich in medical care, rich in entertainment, rich in education. Seven billion people want it. And you can't multiply everything we use on this planet by 10x. The planet would be destroyed, and that is a good precursor to the sustainability talk. Uh, when I looked at that, I said, so how do I find 10x multipliers so we don't need any more steel, but all 7 billion people can have this rich lifestyle, which means good transportation, all that, which is where my public transit idea came from. I decided to work on it. Um, that was the genesis of that paper. And if you look at the world, almost all these problems are solvable and in a sustainable way for the planet and an affordable way for society. Both those are important. Sustainability by itself is not sufficient. It has to be sustainable and affordable. Um, and I looked at it, and it was there was almost no part of non-governmental GDP. I don't deal with governmental GDP. Um, and there's lots of good efforts and philanthropy efforts in that area, like digital public infrastructure, which is the external version from India of Aadhaar, um, which I'm really excited about too, uh, by the way. Uh, and almost all had huge multipliers in technology. Um, and so I, I think it's possible in all these areas. You know, I'm now convinced we can meet all of the world's protein needs in 20% of the land area we use today in agriculture. If we can achieve that, uh, and I won't go into details of how, but in, in this paper I explain my speculation five years ago on how to approach each of these problems technologically, not just a hand baby, we can do it. Um, but if we can, we can return a lot more land on the planet to its natural state, and that'll help solve the climate problem, which I worry about a lot. I started working on climate 20 years ago. 
So we know uh, you talked about AI uh, and the future of technology and how AI can actually be a one-on-one -on -one doctor, one-on-one -on -one, uh, teacher for billions of people across the globe. But there is also a lot of worry around AI and jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, there's uncertainty around is AI doing, going to create the jobs that it is going to uh, mm -hmm. uh, replace uh, in some other sector, in some other place, so people can actually find pathways to better jobs or different jobs at least. Uh, how do you think about uh, uh, AI and livelihoods intersection? So that is a real problem, but only during the transition. I am very convinced in 25 years for countries who adapt this, and countries in politics, especially in democracies, can slow this down because there's so much worry about jobs, that the need to work in human society will disappear. One will only want the, the work because one wants to work on the things we want to work on. An artist wants to work on different things than uh, a sports athlete versus an entertainer. Those are different passions. So people will be free to work on their passions. Uh, but nobody will need to work on an assembly line, assembly, doing one particular bolt on one particular car, eight hours a day for 30 years in a row. That's a horrible job to have. Uh, and those kinds of jobs will disappear. Now, the transition is going to be difficult and messy, and there are solutions. But this will be hugely deflationary. We worry about inflation today. If all medical care is mostly free, if all education is mostly free, if transportation is mostly free, in, in a very specific economics of how you achieve all these and what technologies are needed to achieve this. Uh, when sustainability approaches become cheaper than the fossil approaches, which, is, which can happen in fusion, which can happen with uh, solar and wind, of course, but they're not dispatchable electricity, and so we have to be practical. Uh, when we can produce steel without a lot of energy consumption. And we're even playing with steel production using lasers, not coal. Uh, so radical ideas. I think the society will be hugely deflationary. Productivity will be very, very high. And most people, universal basic income will be a possibility. Uh, and in fact, it's probably the solution we will end up with, whether we, it's in 20 years or 50 years, very hard to predict timing. But I think all that in this utopian world is possible. But the transition to that will be, uh, will be very messy and painful for some. You know, it's great to talk about disruption. The press loves to talk about it. Talk to somebody who's been disrupted. It's not a lot of fun to be the disrupted one. So you have to think about empathetically about the disrupted people and find transition points. But I think they will be possible. So we know in China, uh, uh, the country- So I'm a huge fan of higher taxes and income redistribution uh, and all those things that we don't need to get into today. Awesome. <laughs> Words that people in the Valley generally hate, I'm a fan of. <laughs> While we know said he won't get me, into this it. This is important. Uh, take the following math. The per capita income in the US is about $70,000. People in the back can hear me? Mm. Yeah, good. Uh, and we assumed a 2% GDP growth if you take a 50 year average. That then goes to a per capita income of $175,000 per capita in 50 years. If technologies like AI improve GDP growth rates from 2% to 4%, instead of $175,000 per capita income at 2% GDP growth rate, or G per capita GDP growth rate, we go to 4%. The median per capita becomes 500, close to $500,000. My numbers are approximate, so somebody can do the math. That leaves enough room for redistribution from the excess, not from what we have today, because people are always loath to give up what they have today, 
but they're willing to show, share upside in the future with the less fortunate people in society. The Mike, math works. Vinod said he won't go into the redistribution, but we have two questions for the audience at the end. So if you want, you can go into it. And we'll leave it for Vinod to answer or not. But we know the redistribution is a hard problem, right? Like politics is a very different game than technology. That's why I qualified. I think if you're in a country like China, they use Tiananmen style tactics instead of democratic tactics. So China has an advantage there. <laughs> so if you look at it, right? Like look at China and India journeys, right? China found its way out of poverty through manufacturing, getting farmers to get into iPhone factories at the other end, all in a single generation. And India is trying its way through services led by technology, and that's actually served a very, very small percentage of people, even if it's a very, very large industry. So in this period of transition that you're seeing, the people at the most uh, uh, lower end of the pyramid, sub-Saharan Africa, parts of India, parts of South Asia, are going to be the most impacted because they're the ones sort of taking tea leaves out and uh, plucking coffee and doing very, very low, uh, 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 from a labor productive standpoint, the lowest levels of labor productivity work. Uh, do you think AI is going to disrupt that sooner than it is going so, to so disrupt the is, white collar? Uh, yeah, this is a really important point. I think the higher your skill level, the more expensive you are as a contributor to society, and you're much more likely to be disrupted. Nobody cares about replacing uh, somebody laboring on coffee picking at 20 cents an hour in Africa. It's not economic to go disrupt that. But if you're an oncologist and you make $500,000 a year or more, it's much easier to disrupt the oncologist with AI than it is to pick, and economical to do that than to disrupt the coffee picker. So the coffee picker in Africa will come last I work with a great organization called One Acre Fund in Africa. I think uh, we are well close to a million farms now served by One Acre. And our goal is to get to five million using technology. But nobody's trying to disrupt their work. Uh, but I think an oncologist is a great example. Most people in most parts of the world, including in this country, if they unfortunately get cancer, they are not going to be able to access an oncologist, at least a good oncologist. So an AI oncologist makes oncology much more available in a village in India, and maybe even a full tumor board. You know, when the rich get cancer, they go to Memorial Sloan Kettering or Fred Hutchinson, and they get a tumor board, a personal tumor board. Imagine a villager in India getting that. I think they will get that with AI, and that tumor board will be better than the tumor board at Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York that you might pay a million bucks for. That is the upside uh, for making these equitable and accessible. If we can live through the oncologist opposing uh, the adoption of AI oncologists. So we know you've gotten us all excited and optimist with what technology can do for us in the future, uh, how it will make solutions accessible to poor, et cetera, et cetera. What are the things you but, think? But look, it, this is broader than that. You brought up the work Sirikant was doing. We have an organization called 10-Bed ICU. You know, there was uh, the first COVID wave where we worked with you on getting equipment and other things and supplies to the people who needed it. Soon after that passed, one of the things we realized is even in India, most people in remote areas have no access to even an ICU bed. And we know how important ICU beds was. So Srikant started something called the 10-bed ICU, tele-ICU. Uh, and the goal was very simple. In the 700 districts in India, roughly the equivalent of states, uh, smaller units, 700 districts, and we said every single district in some remote part of, this, uh, of the state should have 
Kelly ICU units that are fully technology equipped where somebody in a regional hospital can provide the services they need from the expertise, the physician, but the tele ICU is remote and the patient only has to go half an hour away or an hour away. So if you're in Nagaland, you don't have to go to the capital of Nagaland, which um, you know is hours away because it's hilly territory. And, and we were able to, in, in, and I helped uh, with the first, or putting the first 100 such units uh, with the idea that the role model would serve. And now I think we are up to 230 districts where we have tele IC units served by a regional hospital, but remotely. So doctors don't have to travel to these remote regions. It's been a great program. I'm really excited about it. And they're running very, very effectively. In fact, uh, I think there's three or four state min chief ministers that have done um, sessions with in just in the last three months as they start to talk about their state's effort. Yeah, I've been following the work in Northeast in particular and the CMS. In are super Northeast in India is very rural very and remote rural. and it's a great place for such an effort. Yeah. But even Karnataka has tele ICUs yeah, yeah. because they have remote regions. But we know that I just want to change gears in the interest of time. We talked so much about technology and how technology can change the world, hopefully for the better, and how such opportunities exist. What are the things you think technology cannot do that is also extremely important when you're looking at philanthropy and trying to serve the communities that are otherwise underserved? Uh, well, there's a lot of things. In the case, you know, take a hurricane. Uh, you know, the Southeast Asia has seen so many catastrophic hurricanes. Uh, we've seen some here. Uh, disaster relief, you know, the, you need organizations like the Red Cross to do that. You can't do it with, with, with uh, technology. It's not a solution for everything. Yes, you can make in COVID remote services available, but there's so many other things to do. And without technology, you wouldn't have the Moderna vaccine, but it's not by itself enough. We needed social and governmental response. We saw a lot of it. I, I, I really um, think it was huge in bringing society together to solve a critical problem like COVID. So and that was all social efforts. So you talked about the fact that Arvind Kejriwal called you during COVID and said, look, it's very difficult to get in government processes, things moving faster. You talked about in disasters, how you come forward and do things that you otherwise can't do. What do you think is the role of philanthropy in enabling governments to deliver better services to people? Well, it's the same things I talked about where we started this conversation. It's setting up role models responding when government has constraints it can't respond to, like timelines. You know, um, we need a decision in 24 hours on getting more oxygen into the streets of New Delhi, right? Uh, government can't do that, but, and frankly, it was a global effort. Salesforce helped a lot. Uh, Amazon, head of logistics, helped, you know, got involved in getting things collected in China and shipped into India for oxygen and uh, all kinds of other supplies. Uh, so it was many technology companies participating and coordinating efforts. Um, so, but it is additionality. It's doing things that governments can't do. Sometimes foundations, societies take too long to do some things. And then the venture risk part is very hard for organized philanthropic institutions to do in the same way that individuals can. Take the risk where there's no proof. To prove it can have work, and then others will take it from there and scale it. Awesome. So I have a list of other questions, but I'll take a pause and open it up to the people here for two questions. And I have, uh, 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 Sanjeev has his hand raised. Can somebody get a mic here? Please say your name uh, and what you do, and just a uh, question. Yeah, my name is Sanjeev Arora. 
I run a project called the ECHO Project um, out of New Mexico, but we work in 195 countries. Um, I've been uh, reading this book, uh, The Changing Wave, and I'm just trying to understand. Uh, you've articulated the most amazing vision for artificial intelligence, and certainly in our project, we do see that role of artificial intelligence to support healthcare workers around the world. There is Were this you showing me the Echo Project folder, or was it somebody else? That was, uh, you know, I happened to meet with your wife, Niru Khosla, yesterday, so it was... Um, it's because I just saw the Echo Project folder in the last 24 hours. No, no, I, I, you, know, you know, she had come to New Mexico to learn about Echo, and anyway, I'm, I'm glad you got to see it. But I, I, the question I have is, the enormous power of artificial intelligence is is clear uh, based on your remarks, and it can certainly change the world. But in history, we've always had bad actors there. And so what are the potential safeguards for the world against these bad actors really yeah. disrupting this beautiful vision that you articulated? Um, so look, technology is a tool that can be used for good or bad. Nuclear is a classic example. You can use it for energy or bombs. Uh, biotechnology, you can use it for Moderna-like medicines, or you can use it for, for engineering a new COVID strain. Um, so technology is a tool, and we can't fundamentally change human behavior. And there's good humans and not so good humans. Uh, and I worry about nation states a lot. Uh, and it's one of the reasons I think we should move as rapidly as, as we can on AI so that we are ahead of China because China, North Korea, Russia, they will use technology to their advantage to the maximum extent. And I think the biggest danger with AI is nation states doing bad things. Uh, of course, individuals can do bad things too, but they usually do it in narrower ways like steal $300 million from Bangladesh by banking, by hacking the central bank of Bangladesh, which happened. Um, so I, I think we have to worry about it. I think the only counter that, that how many people know a comic book called Spy versus Spy, which was popular? A few hands. Uh, so for those of you old enough to know Spy versus Spy, there was a white spy and a black spy, and they always did uh, punch and counterpunch kinds of activity. That's the only approach I can think of. Just have better AI so the good AI can monitor the bad AI. One more audience question. Yes, can we have a mic here? Both are being too nice. <laughs> we'll take both questions. All right. my, my question is about, uh, you know, just like in agriculture, we are going from an extractive, chemical-fed, industrial agriculture, which is very exploitative, to a mindset where it's more circular economy, compassionate, sustainable agriculture. Do you see a similar shift happening in the VC community where Maybe it's more quarterly uh, extractive uh, profit based. So let me, this. so we can do both questions. Let me be quick to answer. I think those kinds of limitations are a failure of our imagination. Let me take the very specific example of fertilizer. Extractive, we may be running out of phosphorus. We have not far from here one of my favorite uh, fertilizer projects. They make fertilizer with zero inputs, out of thin air. And I mean, for those of you who are technical, they take nitrogen from the air, oxygen uh, from water. So just air and water. They put plasma through it, powered by solar power, and that creates what is called lightning in a bottle. So plasma conversion of nitrogen and uh, water in the air, which is the way nature produces fertilizer. During lightning storms, you produce nitric acid that then becomes fertilizer for the plant. So we're producing 
fertilizer from thin air. And people don't believe me when I mean literally from air and water only and solar power. Um, so we are doing that. And that's why I say, saying we have to rely on uh, 1880s uh, process called the Heberbosch process to produce fertilizer, which is most of the fertilizer on this farm, is a failure of imagination that in 2023, we're using technologies from the 1800s. Um, so hopefully that'll spur other people to think creatively about other problems. Uh, it has been fascinating to listen to you, Vinod. My question is, do you think AI or technology has a role to play in driving behavior change to make this world a more compassionate place to get people to make more socially conscious choices? Because ultimately, our emotions are also a biochemical reaction or, or an algorithm. So do you think technology in 20, 30, 40 years will have a role to play in that? So uh, yes, Unclear, uh, a totally clear yes. So. Take medicine. One of the most important behaviors is nudge behavior, and Atul can talk to you about nudge in philanthropy. It's been very, very successful in philanthropy. But let me take you, give you an example uh, uh, that I was talking to my son about, because he's doing AI in primary care. They had a patient, and over 90 days, they had a 88 touch points. That means 88 interactions not conceivable in any part of the world with human uh, medical professional. It wouldn't be affordable. Uh, but with the AI, they were able to drop this patient's blood pressure by 30 points, which is a large number. The biggest drugs don't drop it by 30 points. Without a single in-office visit and one the, and mostly chat, text messaging back and forth. So yes, AI can provide a huge, uh, make a huge difference in, in health, nutrition, any place where behavior change is needed and nudge becomes an important strategy for behavior change. I urge everybody to read this book called, actually it's called Nudge. So thank you all very much. Thank you so much, Vinod, for the time that you spent. It was really lovely. Sure. My biggest takeaway is uh, my willingness to fail is what allows me to succeed. And how do you bring that maxim into venture philanthropy? You know, I know you signed off, but any advice you have to a lot of philanthropies that we have in the room on how they should think about their philanthropy beyond the you risk taking know, we so talked about? I would say be willing to fail. Because risk taking is where we come up with new approaches. And they may not work, but when they work, they're hugely scalable. Um, the, the, so th that's sort of my principal advice. I would also say most people in institutions are limited not by what they can do, but by what they think they can do. You know, you take Give India. It's come so far from when we first talked. The scope and imagination has really expanded the capability in the few, two or three short years. So uh, don't limit your thinking in what you can do. I never limit it. I start with the notion I can replace every car or most cars in most cities and then worry about how later. Um, so I do apologize. I have to run. I'm already late for a meeting in my office. So um, I, I won't be able to stick around, but anybody feel free to email me at vk at coastlaventures.com. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Vinod. <laughs>